Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, my name is John Valier Douglas. I work at CGEN, and it is my pleasure to kick off the final day session by introducing our keynote presentation. So during the course of this conference, we've heard talks highlighting the value that mass spectrometry can bring to our collective efforts to make an impact in the lives of patients through biotherapeutic development. However, what sometimes goes unnoticed is the impact that mass spectrometry can have on investigations into basic fundamental and exploratory questions such as the existence of external extraterrestrial life. So it is against this backdrop today that I would like to introduce our first keynote speaker. Dr. Melissa Trainer is a deputy principal investigator for the Dragonfly mission to Saturn's moon Titan. Part of the NASA Planetary Science New Frontiers program, Dr. Trainer is also the lead for the Dragonfly mass spectrometer D, uh, and it, it, DRA MS, DRA MS, an instrument supporting the Dragonfly investigation of Titan's surface composition and characterization of potential prebiotic chemistry. Dr. Trainer has been a research space scientist in the Planetary Environments Laboratory at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center since 2009. Her research interests include the composition of planetary atmosphere and the production of organic molecules and aerosols via atmospheric synthesis. Dr. Trainer has spent more than a decade characterizing the properties of Titan and early Earth aerosol analogs. Her publications on the topic include chemical, optical, and isotopic characterizations of these analogs produced via electric discharge and photochemical irradiation, with recent emphasis on elemental composition, nitrogen activation, and the influence of trace species such as benzene. Dr. Trainer is a science team member on the sample analysis at Mars experiment aboard the Mars Science Laboratory Missions Curiosity rover with a focus on compositional measurements of the Mars atmosphere. She has led the campaign to conduct the first in situ multi year study of the seasonal variations of the composition of the Mars atmosphere through surface chemistry and mass spectrometry me measurements. She also worked with the, um, the sample analysis Mars. Uh, team to make the first measurements of the full suite of xenon isotopes in Mars atmosphere, as well as an inventory of other noble gases. So the, please welcome me in, uh, in greeting Dr. Trainer today. And the title of her talk is Extraterrestrial Mass Spectrometry, Searching for Habitable Environments in the Solar System. Take it away, Dr. Trainer. Thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, introduction. It's actually a really good overview of some of the topics I'll be talking about today. And I just want to say I'm, I'm really delighted uh, to be here today, um, as was mentioned in the intro, to kind of give you an idea of the flavor of, of some of the other amazing things that we can do with mass spectrometers, you know, throughout the whole solar system. Um, so I wanted to first just step back and, and, and talk about, you know, what what connections can we make between the investigations that we're doing and, um, you know, sort of some of these big, big questions, right? So when we're, when we're talking about exploring uh, outside of Earth, um, we're really led by some of the biggest questions that, that mankind and womankind and people kind have had since the, the dawn of time, right? Um, are we alone? When we look up in the night sky, you know, is, is there any other life out there? Are there any other intelligent beings? Are there even any other microbes out there? Um, and these are some of the biggest questions that drive exploration uh, at NASA. And when we are focused on um, planetary science and looking in our own solar system, some of the questions that we ask are, well, what processes led to the development of life on Earth? Um, why is it that life, you know, even is on Earth? Um, has life developed anywhere else in our solar system? And also, you know, where would we look for it? What makes a planet or a moon habitable for life? Why is it that Earth has life and we don't yet know if other locations do? What, you know, what are the, the key um, environmental parameters that, that are needed for that? So, you know, this is an image of the NASA current planetary fleet. Um, and a major way that we try to answer some of these questions is sending robotic explorers all over the solar system uh, to investigate different planetary environments or, or different planetary bodies uh, to try to get a, a better understanding. They're not all, you know, searching for life or searching for habitable environments, but they are um, helping us better understand just the entire environment of the solar system, the history of the solar system 
system, how the different planets or uh, moons or um, small bodies came to be the way they are and how they could influence uh, both, you know, how life, how life on Earth came to be as well as how it might arise in other planets. What do I mean when I say habitable environment, though? Um, we sort of take a, a very simple uh, explanation of what habitable environment uh, might be by thinking about sort of what are the most basic ingredients that uh, you would want for life. So you kind of see this very simplified across the top here, right? So we know we need sort of the major biogenic elements as well as uh, chemical structures um, that make up life as we know it, right? You know, what we're all sort of built out of. Um, we know there needs to be some kind of energy and also some kind of of liquid as a, as a chemical medium for whatever the biochemistry is that is taking place. Uh, life on Earth is our one data point. So we're typically um, looking for these components in terms of life as, as we know it. Uh, so that would be for carbon-based life. You know, we're, we're typically looking for the schnapps, uh, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and, and sulfur, as well as the types of molecules that can be formed out of those components that we know are very important for the biochemistry for life on Earth. Um, energy, life on Earth uses all sorts of different kinds of energy, and, and that is generally available um, throughout the solar system. Um, and then for the liquid medium, of course, water is, is the general one that we think of, but, you know, we can also imagine potentially some other types of, of biochemical systems that could exist in, in other liquids, but, but generally our investigations have, have searched for evidence of water. So when we can find an environment that has all of these uh, components, then you know an assessment can be made that it is, is habitable. Uh, but it's important to note, of course, that habitable doesn't mean inhabited, right? That's, that's a very different thing, whether or not there actually is life there. Um, and so that's sort of the next step that we wanna take in exploring uh, some of the planetary environments is to also figure out, well, how can we search for evidence that life ever did arise in a place? Um, even if it's it's extinct or if there's extant life in even in small locations. So a few years ago, um, some scientists at NASA put out this framework uh, called the ladder of life detection, trying to um, sort of identify some of the different uh, ways that we might identify uh, evidence of life in an environment. And so you can see on the very bottom of this, habitability is, is just the, the, the baseline. So you assume, you've, once you've figured out if a place is habitable, then what types of other lines of evidence might we look for? And these range on the bottom left from things that <laughs> this paper labeled as suspicious biomaterials, um, primarily meaning you know not, not uniquely evidence of life, um, all the way up to things that, that are much more definitive. And the main reason I wanted to put this up for this group was to point out, you can see while um, some of these are a little bit more um, uh, contextual information or, or macro information, a lot of the lines of evidence that are pointed out are um, molecular, right? So different types of molecules, different types of structures that we would expect to find in molecules or characteristics um, such as chirality. So there's really a lot here that can be addressed with mass spectrometric um, investigations. Um, and that's one reason that mass spectrometry has been very widely used, not just in the search for life um, or the search for habitable environments, but just in general and helping us characterize the components that everything in the solar system is made out of. You know, it really provides really good, broad, uh, versatile, but also, you know, comprehensive approach to helping us understand sort of what is present in the environment. However, uh, it's not without its challenges. Um, so I wanted to just talk through some of the, the things that make it very challenging, of course, when we're trying to put an instrument on one of these robotic explorers and launch it out into the solar system, some of the factors that, that really drive what it is we're able to design, build, and send. Uh, one of these is the punishing launch and, and landing environment. Of course, you have to strap it on a rocket, send it up, and then in a lot of locations, you know, it's coming in um, really fast into an atmosphere and has to slow down really fast and, and get put down on the surface, for example, for a, a surface investigation. We also can see very extreme temperatures, uh, and not just a single temperature, but of course a big variation. You might go between being extremely hot and extremely cold um, in the course of a mission. 
There's very limited power and energy that's available uh, for the instruments. Uh, restricted mass, right? Everything has to be very small, as small as possible. And I did want to give an example of, of what that can look like for even a mission that has its premier instrument is a mass spectrometer. So if you look at the graphic on the right, this is the Mars Science Lab Curiosity rover um, that has been on Mars for some time, and I'll talk a little more about that. The total pi is the mass of, of the rover itself. So this doesn't even factor in all the other things that also launched with it, but the mass of the rover itself, um, and it contains uh, 10 instruments. And that wedge in there, the colored wedge, is the proportion that is the mass of that scientific payload. And of that, you can see the chunk that's taken up by the, the same instrument, which is the mass spectrometer. So even, you know, this is a science investigation and making these measurements is, is the main reason that we go, but you need so much infrastructure to even support that investigation that the mass of, of the instrumentation on the payload ends up being a, a small component. Um, and that's and that's true um, for all missions. And so we're constantly worrying about how much mass our instrumentation is. We also have to think about autonomous control. Right. So everything has to be operated. You know, you send commands up and, and, and the instrument has to be able to do what it's going to do from sample processing all the way through analysis. Uh, and then you have limited communication bandwidth, especially the further out you go in the solar system, uh, the longer it can take to get uh, data back and forth. And finally, high radiation environments, just space in general, uh, the crews to different locations. And then there are certain locations in the solar system that might be extremely high priority science targets, uh, such as um, moons of Jupiter, but they have very punishing radiation environments that can really limit the lifetime of the instrumentation that you send. And it also means that in any instrument we build, you know, we're, we're limited in the uh, parts, the electronics parts, for example, or anything that's radiation sensitive. Uh, but with even with all those challenges, um, we have uh, sent sort of mass spectrometers all over the solar system. Uh, this is a, a really nice graphic that sums this up, uh, all the different instruments um, that have either flown or are close to, to flying. And you can get an idea of the main types of technologies uh, that have been used. Um, throughout time and also as you know we're we're getting more and more advanced in the types of instrumentation that we use on the ground uh, of course we're getting more advanced in the types of instrumentation that we can send into outer space there there's a lag because of all of those challenges that i named uh, but it definitely uh, absolutely tracks um, i want to point out some of the ones that I'll be talking about today are the instruments that have been uh, developed and, and built and delivered um, from our group at Goddard Space Flight Center, which is in Greenbelt, Maryland. And I'll be highlighting some of those investigations that pertain to the this idea of searching for habitable environments, understanding if there's life elsewhere in the solar system. But I do want to point anyone who is interested in digging just a little bit more into the history of mass spectrometry in space and understanding some of these instruments. You know, this is a very dense figure. I uh, definitely want to point you towards uh, this publication, um, which is uh, a Ray Velo et al. Um, in uh, the Journal of Mass Spec from a couple of years ago. So back to looking at all of these different missions, the ones that I would I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about today. Uh, start with Mars. In the bottom left, you can see a little box around the Curiosity rover, um, which is on Mars. And then I'll pivot and I'll talk about an upcoming mission to the Saturn system, to Titan, which is a moon of Saturn uh, called Dragonfly, which is uh, going to further advance our understanding of sort of the chemical environment and prebiotic chemistry. On, an, on another body. Uh, and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, the Rosalind Franklin rover, uh, whoops, as well as um, a new mission, Da Vinci, which was selected as part of a group of missions that are going to be flying to Venus in the next decade. Um, and it's been a long time since we've had um, an in-situ mission of Venus. So we're very excited about that. And I'll, I'll talk about that. OK, so first, let's look at a sample analysis at Mars, or SAM which, as I mentioned, is on Curiosity. Uh, here is Curiosity in one of the selfies uh, that has been taken. We, we get a lot of these, and these are always my favorite images. Um, in any measurement that we make on any other planet, certainly getting an understanding of the molecular composition of surface materials you're investigating or the atmosphere or the environment is really important, and, and, and that's where my work is focused. But context is also very critical when we're looking 
for evidence of habitability or, or any evidence of, of a prebiotic cycle or, or chemistry. And so um, constantly understanding where we are in a, in a location and getting that kind of imagery is, is invaluable to partner with that investigation. So that's one reason we, we take these images very often. Uh, just some notes about Curiosity uh, landed in August of 2012. And so Curiosity has been on Mars for over 3,000 souls, which are Mars days, which are about 40 minutes longer than an Earth day. Uh, the location is in a spot called Gale Crater, which is just south of the equator on Mars. And since landing on Mars, uh, the rover has driven over 16 uh, miles. Here's some info on Gale Crater Mars, uh, just to explain, well, why did we go there and a little bit about what we found. So in the upper left is the artist concept that we had of Gale Crater before landing. And that came from a lot of orbital data on mineralogy at the surface, as well as uh, topography. And the reason this location was so interesting is that there appeared to be evidence of um, past water. So you can see in this cartoon uh, what looked like an alluvial fan. So evidence of a past river and potentially other um, aqueous locations in its past, as well as this mountain in the center, Mount Sharp, had obvious layering of uh, different minerals and rocks. And the uh, thought was at the time, which has since been uh, confirmed since we've been on the ground, is that those layers represent different periods in Mars history going back over three billion years. And much like if you went to the Grand Canyon, you can see all those rock layers, and that's like taking a trip through time. We could do the same thing at Mars, and we could understand transitions from the environment over three billion years ago, which is when life was emerging on Earth, uh, you know, kind of through what led to the Mars that we see today. Um, and as I mentioned, all of all of these things sort of bore fruit. This turned out to be a fantastic location to explore. The upper right image is an area called Yellowknife Bay at the, the base of the crater, the base of the mountain. And this is an ancient lake bed. And you can see the types of rocks that are there and the cracks that are in the rocks. And these are ancient mudstones. And just by drilling into those and taking samples um, and measuring their composition and the mineralogy, we've learned a lot about what that, that lake was like, even though it existed you know, billions of years ago. Uh, we understand that the water was a fairly neutral pH versus uh, something extremely acidic, which has been identified in other locations on Mars. Um, in addition, there is evidence the temperature was very moderate, at least for periods of time. And we talked about the important bio elements, the schnapps. Uh, we found evidence for all of those elements in their sort of bioavailable form um, within, within the rocks, the rocks that made up the base of that ancient lake bed. I'll talk a little bit more about some of the other things that we found. In the bottom left is an image of that Mount Sharp in the center taken from the crater by Curiosity. And again, you can see that layering up close that was originally seen from orbit. And we have found that as we've driven up the side of the mountain, you do transition from periods of time um, and go through different layers of rocks that represent different environmental conditions and really put together this, this uh, picture of what Mars was like in the past. And some of the data that has been taken on the mission was used to make this, this little GIF in the corner, uh, kind of showing what uh, this area Gale Crater was like, again, billions of years ago, versus you know, what we find now with the rover. And so there was this whole area we believe was filled in with water and there was a whole sedimentary system uh, at the base. And then over time, as the mountain formed, a lot of those rocks have been shifted up, as you can see, and, and that's what we're able now to access as, as we're driving up and get information about that past environment. Um, so in, in general, what we, we definitely have found that this is a habitable area uh, on Mars. It was habitable at one time. Again, we don't yet know that it was inhabited, but um, we can talk through uh, some of the really interesting evidence um, and uh, findings that we've made uh, with the investigation. But first, I want to tell you just a little bit more about the instrument that we sent up on Curiosity. This is the sample analysis at Mars, uh, SAM suite. It is really a, a full suite of instruments. And you can see some of the components uh, laid out here. And in the upper right, you can see, get an idea of how big it is compared to sort of the size of a, like a microwave oven, kind of a big microwave oven uh, compared to the people who are installing it in the rover. So the SAM suite includes a quadrupole mass spectrometer. Uh, you can see in the bottom left, that was uh, built here at Goddard. Uh, but we also had a contribution of a gas chromatograph. Um, you can see that 
uh, if you go one image to the right, that was uh, contributed from the University of Paris and our partners at CNES. There's a tunable laser spectrometer that was built at uh, JPL and then integrated here. And the tunable laser spectrometer is actually an excellent complement to the mass spec. It is able to do a very sensitive uh, detections of uh, carbon dioxide, water and methane um, and for uh, carbon dioxide and, and water in particular it has very very high resolution to also get at the isotopic composition of the carbon the hydrogen and, and the oxygen this whole system is supported by a very extensive gas processing system and also a sample manipulation system so in curiosity the rover drills samples and then delivers them to some funnels we have on the top of the instrument if you look at the photo of the instrument you can see those little red top hats uh, in the upper right of that. And, and when you remove those caps, there are some sample funnels there, the funnels go in. Um, and then the sample rotates around a carousel, you can see in the bottom right, uh, with 74 sample cups and can move them around and deliver a sample into the instrument. And then all of that processing has to happen automatically um, based on scripting from the ground. Two other uh, sort of enabling technologies I wanted to point out. Uh, we have a wide range pump, um, which you can see kind of in the middle left of the slide, which um, was uh, developed in conjunction with Criari. Um, and this is basically the turbo molecular pump we'd use to evacuate the gas processing system and the instrumentation. And then we also have these little micro valves, um, which are very small uh, solenoid latching valves that comprise the gas processing system and allow us to control the flow of our analyte around the system. Um, and these are able to be sealed to really um, high leak rates at so 10 to the minus 10 leak rate. But again, and again, everything has to be very small and use very low power. Here's just another image of SAM after it was assembled and just some details on it. The mass range goes up to over 500 um, mass of charge and it's essentially unit resolution uh, with the 10 to the ninth dynamic range. And, and with when you factor in all the processing and all the other things that are done, we've been able to look for um, part per billion to part per million um, detection limits in different components. And then just some, some more elements, you can see the six GC columns uh, that we carry in this image. I mentioned the 74 sample cups. We have two different pyrolysis ovens that are used to heat up the rock samples that we get to, to release the chemicals that are trapped in uh, the ancient sediments. Um, and then we have uh, 54 valves total. This next figure um, is uh, what we call the gas flow diagram. So it is the image of every pipe and every valve and how they're all connected. Uh, and you know, we'd like to joke that this is the simplified uh, gas flow diagram um, because it doesn't include any of the electrical wiring or any of that information. Um, but every time that we want to do an experiment on Mars, we have the software that controls every single thing that is happening in the system, every valve that's opened and when, every heater, what temperature it goes to. Um, and again, that is how we automate how the sample gets moved around the whole instrument in order to, to conduct the experiments that we'd like to do to really understand what's inside the rock samples that we have been uh, given. And this is extremely complicated instrument. I think it's the most complicated instrument uh, that was ever flown to another planet, but it's been um, extremely successful in part because of that complexity, because there's so much uh, flexibility and versatility. When we get new samples, we don't have to keep running the same thing over and over again. You can imagine we can tweak the way that we are processing samples in a lot of different ways because of all of these different potential pathways. All right, so let's get into some of what we have found. This is an image um, as of last week. We have now drilled 33 drill holes on Mars. This is what they all look like. One thing that I am always fascinated to see is uh, how they're all very different colors, even though Mars tends to look very monochromatic um, in images, you know, with a uh, very reddish dust everywhere. Once you get into the rocks and drill down deeper, you do find a wider range, wide range of different mineralogies um, and therefore different formation environments uh, that these are in. And, and as I mentioned, lots of these are sedimentary rocks that were formed in an aqueous environment. So highlight some of the major discoveries. I know that some of these next few slides are gonna be uh, a bit dense and I don't expect you to really dig into them all. I just wanted to give again, sort of a flavor of some of the things that we have found. Uh, one of these of course is organic carbon that has been one of our prime 
goals with this mission was to find, um, see if there's organic carbon compounds that were present um, on the surface now that we could then tie to the ancient environment. Was there any kind of carbon cycle in that ancient environment? And so what we have found, uh, the very first molecule that we found on the surface was uh, chlorobenzene. That was the first in endogenous um, organic molecule that we found, as shown in the upper left here. Um, and it's most likely that that is evidence of a compound that either reacted with perchlorates, which are present on the Mars surface, either reacted with them on the surface over time, or potentially even uh, once in our system, in our oven, when we heat up the samples, uh, we may generate some uh, uh, chlorohydrocarbons just by that process. But the organic molecule that forms the original base of this is certainly present in, in buried in that, that rock environment. Uh, that was the very first one. What's interesting is after discovering the chlorobenzene and then looking back on Viking data from the 70s, we actually found evidence that we think Viking did detect it as well and just sort of um, assumed that it was a contaminant. But we were able to prove that it was endogenous and not a terrestrial contaminant. Uh, in the bottom left is some more evidence uh, that we've seen from some of these same samples, both in that ancient lake bed, as well as up the side of the hill for more organic molecules. Some of the ones highlighted here that are of great interest are um, uh, thiophenes. So some organic molecules that contain sulfur. And again, we know that having sulfur and having sulfur as a component, uh, organic, organic sulfur molecules can be very uh, important when we think about at least you know the type of biochemical processes uh, that we're looking for that we think are similar to uh, life on earth. And then on the right is, is a, just a summary graph showing if you go as you go from the bottom to the top of the plot, this is us uh, going through time uh, of the mission and uh, how much carbon we're finding as we have gone through Gale Crater. Now in this plot, it, it puts all the carbon together. When we heat up rock samples, we see carbon dioxide emissions and those point to a combination of sources uh, which are listed across the top. There is some adsorbed carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. There are definitely carbonate rocks that are on Mars, but uh, a large portion of the CO2 that we're getting out of these samples is actually coming from organic carbon. Um, and and so we can we can kind of see that evidence and see as we go through the environment, everywhere we're going, we're finding uh, organic carbon. And often it's probably some some very, very large molecules that we can't necessarily easily liberate from the sample and uniquely identify. But uh, when they undergo um, some oxidation and we've even done some combustion experiments in, in the oven, you can see you can see that release. So we found organic carbon. That was uh, one of the biggest goals, but another major discovery has actually been um, a nitrate in the samples. And again, remember N is another very, very important nutrient for life on earth. Um, and, but it's really important that, that the nitrogen be, you know, what we would call fixed nitrogen. So it needs to be biologically available. Uh, the Mars atmosphere has um, N2 in its atmosphere, much like we do on earth. Uh, but that triple bond is, is very difficult to break. Um, and so finding nitrates in the soil on Mars tells us that there was a nitrogen cycle, at least on one point on Mars, that made that element, you know, again, available for any kind of chemical uh, reactions that we find. Now, this plot on the left shows how much nitrate we're finding as a uh, weight percent in some of the rock samples. And it's relatively low compared to what we consider some of the, the more barren places on earth, such as the Atacama Desert or the Mojave Desert. Um, but those are places where there is life, right? Everywhere we go on earth, we generally find life. Um, and so it's, it's possible that this amount of nitrate may still represent a, enough of a nitrogen cycle to support, to support some kind of life in the environment. And so I just liked this summary statement that came from one of the big um, summary papers from the mission, which is, um, again, just the fact that we found uh, organic carbon as well as nitrate. These are two extremely important constituents uh, from microbiology. We found them in Gale Crater, and it's possible that the nitrogen is uh, limiting, um, but it's there. And the presence that it's there suggests that, again, that this is a habitable environment, and, and it is possible that there could have been life in the environment. Another interesting discovery is uh, sulfur isotope fractionation. Um, this is a very busy plot. Again, the, the main idea is that 
we're finding evidence throughout the rocks of very wide ranges of sulfur isotope fractionation. And they could come from a, a couple sources and indicate that there is a very active sulfur cycle during warm periods on Mars, probably related to hydrothermal systems as well as some atmospheric processes. And some people, you know, who are really experts in this are very, very interested in this amount of variation in the uh, fractionation because it's, it's hard to get that. We don't see that on earth, you know, without life present. And so we're trying to really understand the processes on Mars that could lead to that kind of uh, variation and fractionations. And then finally, I just want to mention the atmosphere. Um, methane as a very trace gas part per billion level had been identified from ground-based observations on Mars. Um, and it appeared to really come and go in a way that was not well understood. And when we sent Curiosity there and Sam in particular with the tunable laser spectrometer, we were able to make these very, very sensitive measurements of methane. And what you can see in this plot, uh, the pink, dots kind of represent uh, the methane that we've measured throughout the course of a Martian year. And across the bottom, the unit is uh, L sub S, which is solar longitude. So it's basically going from northern spring on the left all the way to um, the end of northern winter on the right uh, over multiple years. And we see that there is definitely this background level methane cycle that has a seasonality to it. Um, and we're trying to understand what processes could lead to that, that formation of that amount of methane and, and keep it sustainable um, on that planet. And what's also been very interesting is as we've measured other gases as well, including oxygen. Um, and oxygen is not expected to vary very much on Mars. It's at the thousand part per, per, per million level. Um, and it should be relatively inert on the time scales of a season. Uh, however, we see huge variations again throughout the year and even from year to year. And it's somewhat intriguing that when you look at this plot of both the blue circled oxygen and the pink uh, boxed methane, you actually see it seems that they they somewhat track each other throughout the year. And that's something we're, we don't, again, totally understand, but we're it's, it's a bit puzzling. Um, and we're digging into this uh, a little bit more. So I just want to now uh, just say, uh, you know, stay tuned. There is always more news coming from the red planet. <laughs> uh, Mars, um, investigations of Mars, it's an extremely active area of NASA. Uh, you may be familiar, we've sent another rover from NASA called Perseverance, uh, which looks a lot like Curiosity, but has a very different scientific payload and is in a uh, Jezero Crater on Mars since February of this past year. And the main job for Perseverance is actually, instead of doing in-situ analysis of rock samples, um, to collect rock samples that look like they might have um, signs of the right kinds of minerals or organics uh, for interest to actually bring it back to Earth for um, analysis on the ground. Because I'm sure, again, you can appreciate as I'm going through all these challenges and describing some of these instruments, you know, there's so much more that we can do on the ground when we can analyze a sample with, with you know, all the most state-of-the-art instrumentation that there is to offer. And even more so when we think about what kinds of um, you know, capabilities we'll have, you know, 10 years from now or 15 years from now, people are still analyzing the Apollo uh, rocks that came back from the moon. And so that's the main focus of Perseverance. Uh, and then on the right, uh, you see the um, Rosalind Franklin rover, which is part of the ExoMars mission. This is led by ESA, but there is a mass spectrometer on board, um, MoMA, Mars Organic Molecule Analyzer, which is sort of another combo combination suite. It includes GC, but the mass spectrometer itself that you can see in that image was built here at Goddard as well. And this is a linear ion trap mass spectrometer. And that mission is, is seeking to drill about two meter depths. So Curiosity drills about this much. Uh, the idea is that we go much, much deeper below the surface and you get away from areas of the surface where radiation or oxidation can really break apart some of the types of organic molecules we're looking for. And they should be much better preserved at great depths. And so ExoMars is taking this approach to dig a lot deeper and to really look for some of the more complex organic molecules that may be present from the ancient environment. Okay, so with that, now I'm going to talk about Dragonfly, which is the mission to go to Titan, the moon of Saturn. So you can see in this nice background image, uh, there is Titan next to its, uh, its uh, planet, uh, Saturn. 
And the Dragonfly mission, um, again, is a NASA mission, a New Frontiers mission. Um, it's being led by the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. Uh, but here at Goddard Space Flight Center, we're playing a big part of um, the scientific payload for that. So some background on Titan. Titan is the second largest moon in our solar system. Here is an image of it um, in wavelengths that allow us to peer through this very thick haze that it has in its atmosphere. It's an organic haze. It's formed from the photolysis of about 5% methane and nitrogen in its atmosphere. Um, and until we were able to get there, actually with the Cassini-Huygens mission, we weren't able to see the surface. We were unclear if the surface would be full of ethane seas or, or just what it, what it was. Um, and we have since learned a tremendous amount about Titan from that mission, which orbited Saturn, but flew by Titan more than a hundred times. And so this is one of those images and you can kind of see the glow of that, that atmosphere around it. Titan is the only moon in the solar system that has a substantial atmosphere. The surface pressure is actually one and a half times that of earth. Um, but it's it's very cold. Uh, the surface temperature on Titan is 94 Kelvin or minus 290 uh, Fahrenheit. And that's of course, because it's very far out in the solar system. Um, and so between that, that higher pressure and that very cold temperature, you get a very dense atmosphere uh, at the surface. Um, but because of its size, it has a low surface gravity. It's about 14, 14% of the gravity of earth and actually 83% of the gravity uh, of our own moon. Um, one thing that we learned uh, with Cassini is a better understanding of what, not just what the surface is, but sort of the, the interior of Titan. And so you can see in this cross section uh, that we've inferred that there is a deep interior ocean of liquid water in between ice layers. And so I like to draw analogies of the interior of Titan to that of Earth, of which most of us are much more familiar. And so you think about um, you know, there is a uh, sort of silicate rock core at Titan, um, but then there will be a liquid layer around it. Whereas on the earth, that would be liquid rock, right? And we would think of that as the mantle on Titan, that's it's water. It's some kind of water, maybe with some other components in it, uh, but that is that liquid layer. And then on earth, you would have a crust uh, on top of that, which is what we all, you know, stand and, and walk around on that that's also made of rock, but on Titan, that would be water ice. And the water ice is so cold that it's actually as hard as rock is on earth. Um, and then on earth, you'd have some, you know, soil dirt that we all, we all dig in um, on Titan, any types of loose material like that, or that would be kind of like a soil would actually be made up of organic material. Uh, that is, as I mentioned, it's sort of synthesized high up in the atmosphere with photochemistry and then deposits on the surface. Uh, so Titan is um, simultaneously somewhat familiar and I'll, it has some geographic features that are very, uh, or geologic features that are very familiar to us, yet it's, it's very exotic in the types of materials. So we can think it's like uh, similar, but not similar. And it's just a really fascinating place. Uh, this is the map of Titan surface um, made by um, composites of a few different wavelengths. Um, and as I mentioned before, we went there with Cassini, we didn't really know what that surface was necessarily going to be like. And, and since going there, we've now discovered that it's a very, um, very diverse surface environments uh, with lots of different compositions. The colors that you see here tell you where you have different compositional units. We can't say exactly what those compositional units are, but I can tell you that the brown area is different from the blue area, which is different from the white area. Um, and many of the areas, uh, we indicate very high amounts of water ice or water ice is exposed and then areas where it appears that it is covered up with the organic material that is that is sourced from the atmosphere. I'll see evidence of things like craters. And then in the North Pole, in the upper left of this image, you see sort of black black patches and those are actually hydrocarbon seas made primarily of liquid methane and ethane. So when we think about Titan, actually we go back to one of those very first slides I showed and, and Titan has key ingredients that we think are necessary for life. It has energy in the form of sunlight, as well as the photochemistry, um, which delivers complex molecules to the surface. Uh, we know there's lots of organic chemistry. It's like the opposite of Mars, where we're looking for every small organic molecule. You know, here we're sort of awash in organics. And this image, um, uh, the upper left image shows the haze, as well as the views we got of the surface with a probe that we sent into Titan, um, where the surface is, as I mentioned, kind of just covered in almost like this uh, dust that, that we think is the organic material. 
And then we know that there is uh, water available in the environment. I talked about interior water in the subsurface, but in actuality, there are times where liquid water will have been available on the surface of Titan despite its cold temperatures. Um, this would come from impacts, high energy impacts that would come in and melt the surface ice for periods of time, as well as potentially cryovolcanism, just like we have eruptions of liquid, um, you know, magma that comes out and um, forms lava on earth and takes a while to cool off, you could have eruptions of liquid water or water ammonia mixtures on the surface of Titan that emplaces that material out and again takes some time to cool off. And so we're, there are areas on Titan where we think there has been transient liquid water environments uh, and then in contact with all of these organics and, and the energy sources, and those could last for up to 10,000 of years. And then finally, you know, we talked about, well, maybe water isn't the only solvent that's important for different kinds of biochemistries. And we know that we have uh, methane seas with some ethane, um, and we know there's a very active methane cycle on Titan. We get clouds uh, of methane. There's methane rain. You, you get kind of, again, a cycling through the environment, just like we do with the water cycle here on Earth. And so it's a really, really fascinating place to understand what are the limits of habitability of a location in the solar system? What makes a place habitable? And how far, you know, we know there's this rich organic chemistry taking place. How far can you get towards what we think of as, as important prebiotic chemistry or towards biological molecules when you've got these kinds of processes happening over, you know, hundreds of millions or billions of years? So to learn more about it, to do that investigation, um, uh, enter the Dragonfly mission. Uh, Dragonfly is a relocatable lander to explore Titan's habitability and prebiotic chemistry. What does that mean? Uh, what it means is that this mission really spends most of its time on the ground, much like a Mars rover. But instead of driving from place to place to investigate the composition of the surface and other attributes, you know, in different places, um, we fly. Uh, we fly because Titan has a lower gravity and a very thick atmosphere, which makes it possible to do so. And in using sort of this, this it's a, you know, a dual quadcopter uh, drone-like flight approach, we're able to cover much larger distances. I mentioned that Curiosity has driven over 60 miles in its time um, on Mars, um, and Dragonfly could do that, you know, in a couple of weeks, uh, depending on, on how, how ambitious we want to be. So uh, the plan is to launch in 2027 and arrive in the mid 2030s to visit dozens of sites uh, as we sort of, you know, make these long hops on the surface. Um, and it's designed to be powered with um, a nuclear power source, uh, the multi-mission radiothermal isotopic generator, which is the same thing used on Curiosity and Perseverance. Uh, and so that enables us to have a long uh, prime mission of over three years on the surface. Um, I've sort of hinted at why why we can do this at Titan and not necessarily, um, for example, at at Mars. This uh, not only is it follow a paradigm of a Mars rover exploration, it's about the size of a, a Mars rover, which is the size of a very small car. Um, and again, we can do that because heavier than air mobility is efficient at Titan um, because of the denser atmosphere and the lower gravity. It just doesn't take as much energy to to lift the the craft. Uh, we can do it again because if it's powered by the radioisotopic thermal electric generator or MMRTG, um, then the that can charge the battery. You can use it for flight, and then you can use it for science. We utilize waste heat, um, and and that such a power source can enable a very complex, a very sophisticated scientific payload that we then can bring place to place. And again, I have to uh, mention that we're designed to use the MMRTG, but that's a pre-decisional. NASA makes that decision um, and whether or not that source is uh, ultimately available. And we're also designed for direct to earth communication. You can see in the bottom right image, our high gain antenna is deployed. So there's no orbiter to go along with it. We communicate directly with Earth when Earth is over the horizon for Titan, which is for eight days every 16 days. So the Titan day is 16 Earth days long. And so we get eight days of um, a day on Titan and then eight, eight days of night. And during that time, we're out of uh, communication um, until, until Titan comes back around. We can see it again. I'm going to talk a little bit more just about where we're going. 
uh, the landing site and area of exploration for Dragonfly is an area near a large impact crater. You can see in this image on the right, it's called Selk Crater. It's, it's on the order of 70, 80 kilometer diameter, a really large crater where enough energy would have been put in the system for there to be, as I mentioned earlier, a very large melt pool that would have persisted for a very, very long time. And we can see from these images uh, that we do have from flybys of Titan that there is a lot of exposed water ice, which uh, appears to be the impact melt. And so we can access areas where there was liquid water formerly on the surface, where organics would have been raining into it. There would have been some kind of, um, you know, aqueous chemistry going on with those organics that, that in some ways, uh, you know, is similar to the type of chemistry that's been pointed out as potentially important on uh, the early earth uh, for um, the advancement of uh, prebiotic chemistry and towards the biochemistry. So we're very interested in looking at that location. Uh, we land south of there in an area full of dunes. These are actually dunes made up of, we believe, organic sand material. So uh, most likely originally sourced from the uh, material produced in the atmosphere, deposited on the surface, and then somehow generates uh, a sand that makes these, these long linear dunes. And in between uh, these dunes, you have these white interdune areas as well, where there is some exposed water ice. So we're we're going to this location because in this three-year mission, we're we're able to access all of these fascinating different kinds of materials and these different environments that we think could have been very important uh, in Titan's history. Uh, we're doing so again with a. Um, uh, advanced scientific payload that focuses on the chemical inventory, as well as just the context of the environment to understand the habitability of the environment. Uh, the instruments include the, those that are listed here. I'm going to focus on the mass spectrometer, which we call DRAMS, the Dragonfly Mass Spectrometer, uh, which is fed by a drill known as a DRACO, which is the drill for acquisition of complex organics that's able to drill into that cold, cold cryogenic surface and deliver samples to the mass spectrometer for analysis. We also have a gamma ray neutron spectrometer that can measure the bulk elemental composition around our landing site. It gives us our first look at whether are we sitting on a big block of water ice? Are we sitting on organics? Are we sitting on organics on top of water ice? You know, kind of gives that, that first um, uh, reconnaissance of, of the type of material we're on. We also have a full geophysics and meteorological package to measure um, the environment as well as po possible seismic activity and a full camera suite because we can't fly on Titan without taking lots and lots of <laughs> pictures and, and images. And, and it's not just you know, for our uh, enjoyment, but also, of, of course, as I mentioned, the context of the environment in which you make these chemical measurements is, is so critical for understanding how the materials even got there in the first place. This is just a little bit about DRAMS that's being developed uh, here at Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, it inherits strongly from SAM and MoMA, uh, which are both Mars instruments. Uh, I talked a lot about SAM and the gas processing system and then just the whole uh, lineage of um, electronics and processing and how we build mass specs here at Goddard uh, go into DRAMS. Um, but the instrument itself is a um, dual inlet ion trap mass spec, which is most similar to the MoMA mass spectrometer that uh, was developed here at Goddard uh, for MoMA, and we're using it here for DRAMS. It allows us to use two different modes to access the composition of the surface materials that are drilled and delivered. We have a laser desorption mass spec, and we're going to be using on the samples initially to look for the different types of high molecular weight organics that may be there and, and get a first, first assessment of the type of composition of the materials in each location. It allows us to compare location to location and really build up uh, an image of how the composition is varying as we're flying around the surface. Uh, we also have a gas chromatography mass spec, and the GC is um, as in... SAM is provided by Kness and they're uh, excellent partners in this. And that's where we'll really start to do the select, more selective analysis uh, using derivization processes to look for some of the biologically relevant molecules. Um, things like amino acids, um, really anything that shows evidence of hydrolysis processes in the past. So any molecules that would have um, oxygenation or oxygenated groups on, on them. Um, and in uh, DRAMS, we have the sample carousel has about 60 cups total to and that can deliver samples to each of these different inlets. And I, I just put some of the characteristics in the bottom. Um, and I know I need to wrap up soon. Uh, Dragonfly will provide a detailed investigation of carbon on Titan's surface. Here's a flavor of how those different instruments 
will work together against a somewhat dense uh, slide, but we'll be able to image the samples that we're ingesting with the microscopic imager with the UV fluorescence capability. We're going to look for areas where we even see carbon and oxygen present with the elemental analysis. And then on the right, you can see, um, you know, we'll use the mass spectrometer to really get at the molecular composition with our, our two complementary approaches. And uh, that includes, we do carry one of our GC columns has the uh, ability to separate an antimer. So we are looking for molecules that might exhibit a chiral preference. So that will be coming soon um, to a uh, NASA press release near you, Dragonfly <laughs> successfully landing and, and flying around uh, Titan. So uh, again, the slate for launch in 2027. And then the last mission uh, in my last minute uh, that I want to talk about is this new mission to Venus. Um, uh, the U.S. last sent a probe to Venus in 1978, and so it's been a very long time, and it's been a long time coming to go back. We have a lot of questions about Venus, even though it's so close to us and, and so similar to us. In a lot of ways, it's one of the most mysterious planets for us. Um, and one of the biggest questions you wonder, well, Venus, I hear is nasty and hot. What does this have to do with habitability and life? <laughs> but the answer is Venus wasn't always that way. Um, uh, there's an understanding that in the past, it most likely had a very large ocean and, and was much, it was very possibly habitable billions of years ago. And we want to understand how did it get to be the way that it is today? Why does it not look like Earth any, any longer if it ever did? Um, and, and was it possible that it was habitable in its past? So part of what we need to do is the deep atmosphere of Venus is very challenging environment to go to at all, um, and especially to make really, really good measurements. And as I mentioned, we haven't been, the U.S. has not sent anything since the 70s. So this chunk of Venus's atmosphere um, is, is really largely unknown, especially the last 20 kilometers near the surface. But it's in that environment where we can find a lot of clues of what types of rocks are on Venus, what kind of history did the surface formation have? Were there ever any kind of plate tectonics? Is there still active volcanism? Um, how did it and when did it lose its water? All, all these questions that can help us better understand Venus's past. And the Da Vinci is a probe that will go into the atmosphere of Venus and it will carry a mass spectrometer, um, a quadrupole very similar to the one that is on the same instrument on curiosity and we'll be able to measure major chemical species and we're also looking at noble gases um, that's even further out so with that i'm going to conclude um, there are so many people whose work is reflected in this set of slides i couldn't possibly list them all so i went the easy way and just listed all the teams um, just incredible scientists engineers uh, technicians and and you know, many, many people, as you can imagine, hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people involved in each of these successful missions. Um, so this MSL, uh, the full Dragonfly team, um, the Da Vinci team, as well as just in general, the support of NASA science exploration, um, as well as, you know, the American people uh, who continue to be captivated and interested in this type of investigation and giving me the privilege to take a part of uh, exploring our solar system. And this is one of my favorite images, a uh, pale blue dot image taken of Earth from the Saturn system. So thank you right. very much. I take questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Trainer. That was a fantastic and interesting talk. And um, selfishly, I was uh, hoping that people wouldn't ask a lot of questions so I could use this opportunity to ask you all my questions. But um, our audience has a lot of questions. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and just start from the bottom and we'll see how far we get. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So starting from the bottom, what aspects of MS performance are most important to develop and advance our ability to interrogate fundamental questions regarding extraterrestrial life? What is on your wish list? <laughs> um, there's a couple of things. Um, and actually, I think we're just putting out a paper. Um, the first author is Chow, C-H-O-U, which is, is going to be a review paper just of how do we use mass spec to kind of advance um, finding evidence of life finding biosignatures. So there's a lot of components, um, you know, high, high resolution, of course, uh, is, is one of them. And that's one that has been slowly coming along um, just to be able to properly, you know, distinguish uh, different molecules, um, really good isotopic uh, separation. If we are able to use isotopic measurements to assess uh, the different reservoirs in an environment, you know, that's, that's important on earth because we understand the difference between biological carbon and, and, um, you know, inorganic carbon and on other planets uh, that's harder because you need the context of all the isotopes. So, um, the ability to 
do th those kinds of measurements uh, for sure. Um, really, really low power and, <laughs> uh, you know, electronics that, um, you know, really s small, light, very radiation tolerant, because um, to be honest, uh, you know, the, you can have the most sophisticated instrumentation and sampling system, but you have to have the electronics to control it. And, and, and another big challenge is the more sophisticated our instruments get, you know, I mentioned high resolution. So let's say we want to fly an Orbitrap, um, but now I have like crazy amounts of data that I have to deal with and I have to get that data back to earth. Um, and so I also, we're looking a lot into machine learning and, and more ways that we can autom automate processes. I have a really big wish list, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <sorry. laughs> um, and, and so I'll just point to this, this coming out soon paper um, uh, by Chow et al, because uh, it, it highlights some of those aspects. And one of the, the biggest ones we want to do, though, in searching for life in the solar system is to not put too many blinders on. Um, so there's this, this really growing field uh, of agnostic biosignatures, which is just really trying to understand um, how can we identify molecular systems that are biochemical if they don't look identical to ours, right? We don't want to limit ourselves to saying, I have to find this set of molecules exactly like this or it's not life, right? We, we need to keep our um, uh, analytical capabilities um, uh, broad enough and our ability to interpret them um, uh, enough to identify something that could be a biological system, even if we don't immediately recognize it. Uh, and so that's just something really important to keep in mind um, as well when we just think about doing these explorations and how we're going to interpret the data we get back. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, I want to switch to some of the more um, questions that relate to um, the environments around the extraterrestrial planets and moons that are being explored. And so one of the questions that's been offered up is um, you mentioned the presence of sulfur, methane, carbon dioxide emissions, both indicative of potential life. As these are present in the deep sea, namely hydrothermal events, et cetera, have you or do you plan to do any collaborative work with deep sea researchers and scientists? Um, so uh, yes, NASA, <laughs> as we've been pushing out, especially in the outer solar system, there's this whole collection <laughs> of uh, worlds um, that we have realized in the past decades are, are habitable in their own right. That includes, I mentioned Titan, um, Europa, Enceladus. These are moons of the giant planets in the outer solar system. But because of their interactions with those giant planets, they have these kinds of tidal energies um, and, and these subsurface oceans. And so this is this new-ish area of, of NASA exploration. Where we're really focusing on what we call ocean worlds. And there's been a big push in that. and and people in the planetary community, so not just myself, just this is a broad approach, are working uh, very collaboratively with oceanographers, people who study the Earth's ocean, to, to get a much better understanding of how we can interpret uh, an extraterrestrial ocean. What can we look for in that ocean that will tell us whether or not it is habitable or what kinds of signs of life should we be looking for? Um, in particular with exploration of, of Europa, which is the Jupiter moon that, that has this uh, relatively large uh, subsurface ocean um, with rock, you know, rock at the bottom, expected hydrothermal activity, but then an ice shell on the outside. Um, in particular, that, that effort uh, to explore both with a flyby mission as well as hopefully an upcoming lander um, has, has moved the community to really engage uh, the oceanographer uh, community. And there is a lot of very collaborative exploration going down to the deep sea, um, exploring those environments by planetary scientists. Unfortunately, not me, though. That would be really cool. I would love to. <laughs> I haven't yet gotten to do one of those. Cool. All right. Um, uh, another question relating to um, to actually to Mars now. Um, you mentioned that there were seasonal trends in methane and oxygen that were similar to gas phase. And now are these similar? I'm sorry. Are there similar cycles of gas phase uh, uh, exchange uh, and seasonality occurring on Earth? And maybe maybe a related question: If you're able to track um, these compounds and and their seasonal variations. Could you then back calculate or infer like the level of biomass that might be giving rise to these? <laughs> yeah, so um, the seasonality question, I just uh, want to mention one of the things that's sort of unique about Mars, and I, I didn't bring this up, um, 
is the atmosphere is constantly going up and down in pressure every year. So it has this seasonal cycle of the whole atmosphere going up and down. And that's because you form polar caps from carbon dioxide, which is the main component of the atmosphere. So 30% of the atmosphere actually freezes out at the winter pole. And then when it's spring, it sub, you know, sublimes, the pressure goes up and then the whole thing moves and then it condenses out on the other Northern pole when you transition. So, so Mars has, has really fascinating uh, seasons driven by this motion. So you've got not just carbon dioxide dropping in and out, but you have these big dynamical forces, right? That are transporting gases kind of back and forth. Like, um, you know, you can almost think like, like big winds or something. Um, and so the, the seasonality that you see could, what we always have to do is factor in, okay, there's some gases that are totally inert, like argon, and don't interact with anything, don't have a source, don't have a sink. So they go along for the ride. So we watch those ones go along for the ride and that sets our baseline of what a seasonal seasonal trend is. Um, and then it's when things act outside that trend that they pop out. And that's what happened with the oxygen, for example, um, or, or the methane. Um, so, the, so that's the context kind of of, of those measurements. Um, the question about the biosphere that might need to support it. So, I've still very much taken the approach that we have to explain what we're measuring, explain this phenomenon with anything but life, really. Um, the, I think the, the expression is it's the um, explanation of last resort in, in planetary exploration is that something is, is, is some kind of life. And so there's really a lot we don't understand about how the Mars surface interacts with the atmosphere or potential sources that could be in the subsurface that could be linking this methane um, or, or the oxygen to what's going on seasonally. Uh, and, and there's a lot we, we really need to understand better there, but I am sure that people have taken our measurements and estimated, well, if it were life, this is how much you know it, it could potentially be. Um, another intriguing possibility about the methane is it could be that it's coming from ancient reservoir of methane that's being released into the atmosphere. And, and that reservoir, you know, maybe that came from an ancient uh, biosphere before getting locked up in, in something like uh, clathrates, uh, for example. So there's still a lot of intriguing ideas around it. And, and that's one reason why the methane um, is so is so interesting. And, and I didn't show the other data that shows every once in a while there was like a big plume of methane that we would see. Um, and, and it's, you know, we've been on the surface of, of uh, Mars for nine years now with curiosity, and we're still trying to understand some of what we're seeing because we're constantly learning new things that make us ask new questions. Yeah, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, regarding um, uh, Mars and Titan, um, those are obviously uh, very um, harsh environments and contrasting environments, um, specifically with temperature, pressure, and radiation differences between the two. Are you able to comment on the differences in the type and level of engineering considerations that exist between rovers delivered to each one of those different uh, celestial bodies? Yes, absolutely. This is what I'm living and breathing right now, uh, particularly for the instrumentation that we're sending. Um, so on, on Mars, you know, you, we have a lot more uh, radiation and we have much bigger temperature swings. So it's because of its thinner atmosphere, it's, it's, much more strongly influenced by uh, the sun, the seasons, the time of day. And so you get big changes um, in uh, temperature. And so you have to factor that in and that can factor into how, when we can run the instruments, for example, you know, when are they in or out of their survival zone versus operating zone? How, how will you have to control that? Um, whereas on, um, Titan, we have this very thick atmosphere. It is further from the sun. And because of that, A, there's hardly any radiation at the surface. So once you're there, you're, you're in pretty good shape and you don't really get any temperature swings. It, so it's very, very cold. It's that 94 Kelvin, but then it only goes up and down a couple of degrees. Um, so there it's a very different challenge. It's less, you know, constantly managing different thermal environments. It's there's one very hard thermal environment that you have to live through, right? You have to keep yourself warm enough. You can't freeze over. You have to find a way to keep everything inside your lander uh, warm with that constant heat sink of, of sucking things out. And so it, it changes um, a lot of our approach in that kind of, um, you know, thermal management of, of how we do things. Um, and also just 
where, where are your worry spots, right? You know, so I don't spend any time hardly worrying about radiation uh, for Titan, whereas that would be a bigger concern um, at Mars and an even bigger concern, as I mentioned, around, around Jupiter. And there's probably a million more things I could, I could talk about this, but, but uh, I'll let you keep asking. For <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. All right. Um, with uh, with that, I think we have ran out of time for questions, uh, unfortunately. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to uh, my co-chair for this session, uh, Rich Rogers, and he will introduce uh, our next session. Thank you again, uh, Melissa, uh, for a great talk on a very fascinating topic that um, I think it probably interests us all uh, a great deal.